Amen. So again, welcome. And I pray you will, are all ready to hear this crucial talk concerning health and also about fasting. Now, many of us have tried fasting before, but it is very customary that many of us have been so used into eating all the time, whether, whether we eat two meals a day or even three meals a day, which is regularly, which is customary with many of us throughout the world, especially here in this country of the United States. But we find fasting a very hard thing to accomplish and even to carry out in order to preserve health. And I'm sure many of us have a very hard time in doing so. Amen. So therefore, we want to look at Christ, how that he had overcame on the point of appetite and that by his example, we can also overcome on this hard point of appetite as well. Amen. And therefore, I want to read you before we get into our Bibles. Amen. We'll be using our Bibles this evening. But I want to read you from the book called Councils on Diet and Foods in page number two, mm, page 185, in the 10th chapter of this book called Fasting. We want to read a part of where Christ overcame sin when he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness of temptation. So it says right here, starting page 185 and paragraph number one, you see how that, how what really motivated Christ to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, which was for nearly six weeks, and what is the main goal behind this fasting? And, and why should we fast as well in, this, in the same way that Christ fasted? Not that, not that we should fast for 40 days and 40 nights, because that's an impossibility, amen? Because there's no benefit behind it, we're told. But specifically, blessings to you, blessings to you as well, Brittany, thanks for joining. But we need to understand clearly the whole aspect, aspect and the goal behind fasting and why is it important in our Christian life. So it reads right here, and this is quoting from The Desire of Ages, page 117 and 118, by the way. It's a confirmation. It reads, with Christ as with the holy parent Eden, appetite was the ground of the first great temptation. Just where the ruin began, the work of our redemption must begin. So first of all, just as the the ruin of sin, just as sin be, sin was rooted, it, it, it was originated as a result of the indulgence of appetite, even so the work of redemption must also begin on the point of overcoming the indulgence of appetite. It reads further, as by the indulgence of appetite Adam fell, so by the denial of appetite, Christ must overcome. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. This is quoting from Matthew chapter 5, no, chapter 4 rather, in verse number 1, verse number 2, and verse number 3, and verse number 4. You can read that in your own time. It reads, and when the tempter came to him, that Satan, he said, if thou be the son of God, commanded these stones be made bread. But Christ answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we see the example of Christ after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was out there in the cold. Blessings, Teresa. Thanks for joining. He was out there in the heat of the day and in the cold of the night suffering from pain, kings of hunger. I mean, can you imagine? For 40 days, he was out there in the wilderness dwelling amongst the wild animals. He had nothing to eat and, and of course, possibly nothing to drink. He was out there with the, with the animals, suffering from the heat of the day, the, um, the sun rays of the desert sun, nowhere to go. Blessing Xavier, thanks for joining. I... I uh, I sent you a tweet earlier. Please check it out later after I'm done. So Christ was suffering from, from intense hunger and he had nothing to eat throughout the entire day. 24-7. Day one, day two, day three, day four, throughout the entire day, even the night. I mean, he had no blanket. He had no pillow. 
He probably, he probably was resting on the rock like Jacob did. Amen. Oh, praise God, Xavier. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm honored as well. So he was resting on the ground with no blanket, and he had no covering in which he can shield himself from the cold of the night. And I'm sure that he felt very cold. He was shivering a lot. And his 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 um his arms and his legs were moving about constantly. And when the sun rose up, he felt very weak and emaciated. And, it, and he went about and prayed earnestly before his heavenly father. Throughout their nearly six weeks. None of us can do that today. Because, of course, if any of us attempt to fast, abstain from food for 40 days, we will be dead by then. We will be dead by then. So... So don't even think about saying, oh, I must fast for 40 days and 40 nights like Christ did. Don't do that. Because if you try it, you will die. So let's not be presumptuous concerning the fact that as we're now in the last days and, the hum and humanity is so degenerate enough in which all these things in which we think were good back then, are now so diseased as a result of the wickedness of man upon the earth. But thank God for Jesus Christ, who had done, who went through all of these things for my sake and for your sake, and thus show us an example of how that we can overcome sin, and that just as he overcame, we too can overcome. But many of us say, I can't overcome the point of appetite. Appetite is overpowering me. I cannot even abstain myself from just a single meal a day. Just to give it a trial, just to give it for a few hours, just to try out what will be the result of giving my mind and my stomach rest from overeating and indulging in certain foods that are not good for you. Especially if you're indulging in good food, such as a plant-based diet. Even as a plant-based diet, you still need to practice self-control. You understand that? We must be temperate, as Paul says. In all things even in the good things we must be very careful that we do not put anything before God amen so I want you to picture in your mind if you can if you if you cannot that means that God's Word is more powerful than even our own imagination as well as the ways of God amen Christ was throughout the throughout the day the morning the afternoon and throughout the entire night even the midnight shivering suffering and throughout that long fast he was suffering a gradual loss of weight and flesh after 40 days you can imagine how how skinny he was how dry his lips were he had nothing to drink and how pale his face was and how haggard he was after he had nothing to eat he, he had no bread no water not even meat because he could have killed those animals that were in the wilderness and serve himself food. He could have done that, but he did not do that. As a result of his constant communion with his Heavenly Father and being so strongly connected with him. But many of us are not doing that. I know that I myself am not doing that, and I pray that all of us would improve better by the grace of God. Now let's read further. It reads, from the time of Adam to that of Christ, self-indulgence had increased the power of the appetites and passions until they had almost unlimited control. Thus men have become debased and diseased, and of themselves it was impossible for them to overcome. In man's behalf, Christ conquered. I love those words. Christ conquered. Put that in the chat stream. Christ conquered by enduring the severest test for our sake he exercised a self-control stronger than a hunger or death mm. and in this first victory were involved other issues that enter into all our conflicts with the powers of darkness when jesus entered into the wilderness he was shut in by his father's glory Absorbed in communion with God, he was lifted above human weakness, but the glory departed, and he was left to battle with temptation. It was pressing upon him every moment. Can you imagine that? When temptation comes within, within your, 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 um, 
your circle, you feel the urge in your flesh saying, do it, do it, do it. It will make you feel good. It will satisfy your, your need, your desire, and it will be all right. That is Satan talking to you, talking to you right in your mind. But with God's word, you can say, like Christ, it is written. Denying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We must use the same weapon which, with which Christ overcame the desires of the flesh as well as Satan himself. Amen? Let's move further. His human nature shrank from the conflict that awaited him. For 40 days he fasted and prayed, weak and emaciated from hunger, worn and a haggard with mental agony, his visage, his, his, facial, his facial feature was so marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of men. Now was Satan's opportunity. Now you suppose that he could overcome Christ. But did he overcome Christ? No, he did not. Christ overcame him by the word of God and by the word of the Father's testimony. That was a is, listen. This is not by accident that that Satan used appetite as the way in which he sought to conquer Christ. This, you know, why? Because that was a point in which man fell first years before, ages ago, at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Satan first tempted Eve, saying, "You should not surely die once you eat of that forbidden fruit. If you do." You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The lie of the devil, spiritualism, thus deceiving Eve into thinking that by disobeying God's command, by indulging appetite, you will rise into a higher state of existence. But when Eve fell by yielding to temptation, instead of rising higher, she came down lower. She sought to become more than, than what God created her to be, but instead, instead of facing that imagination that Satan insinuated and brought up in her mind, she became lesser than what she was. She became lesser than a woman instead of becoming more than a woman. And likewise, Adam, when Adam yielded to temptation, being brought by his own wife, instead of becoming more than a man, he became less than a man. Are you following me? This is how Satan deceives our, our, our perceptive organs when we indulge upon appetite. That's why appetite is now not just appetite um, in itself, because appetite in itself, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong on that. I'm not saying that appetite is wrong. Appetite is good in and of itself, unperverted, but perverted appetite. Appetite used in the wrong way will lead you to destruction. Are you following me? That's what that's the appetite that that Satan used to bring down Adam and Eve from their state of perfection. And we're going to talk about gluttony in a moment. I'm glad you brought that up because gluttony is, is also another way which you can say indulge jing appetite. Amen. Now let's read further. Next paragraph. Now this is taken from letter page 158 written in 1909 by Ellen G. White. It reads, Christ entered upon the test upon the point of appetite and for nearly six weeks resisted temptation in behalf of man. That long fast in the wilderness was to be a lesson to follow man for all time. Christ was now overcome by the strong temptations of the enemy and this is encouragement for every soul who is struggling against temptation. So this example of, of, of overcoming appetite is one way in which we can overcome other sins that result from indulging appetite. Amen? Now let's read further. I personally believe the temptation in the garden was about independence from God, not appetite. Now, now please, now take... Just listen carefully to what is being presented here because I don't want you to, to, to misunderstand what is, what is being said right here because it was clearly upon appetite right now. 
So don't stray off right now. It's not, because indulging appetite is, yes, is somewhat independence from God, straying, straying from his word. But once again, it was still upon appetite. Don't exclude appetite from, 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 um, from you know, that, that sin in which sin was originated because it was clearly upon appetite. Okay, so don't disagree with that. Okay, it was upon, upon um, appetite as it says right here. So please listen further. Listen further. So where I left off, Christ has made it possible for every member of the human family to resist temptation. All who would live godly lives may overcome as Christ overcame. Amen. By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, that long fast of the Savior strengthened him to endure. He gave evidence to man that he would begin the work of overcoming just where ruin began. Dash on the point of appetite. Again, like I, like I just said, it was on the point of appetite that man fell. And even so, it was on the point of appetite that Christ overcame by denying appetite. I hope, I hope you're following me and understanding this. Amen? So, Let's take let's take further notice right here. So, appetite is is something that is natural. That's a natural desire. Greetings, Marilyn. Thanks for joining. Appetite is not something which it just has that is just has something to do with food. It's not just with food. Appetite can be with anything. Okay, so look at the, the proper definition of the word appetite. Appetite means a natural desire in which to fulfill the needs of your body, especially as it pertains to food. But it's not just food, it could be with any desire, such as a, an appetite for, um, for, um, for fornication, an appetite for power, an appetite for attention, an appetite for um, in becoming well-known, an appetite for technology, and so on and so forth. The, these are the appetites which many people even here today, even here in this country especially, this so-called Christian nation is lusting after and has an appetite for. It's not just food. You understand that? So don't get confused about appetite always oh, only has to do with food and nothing else. It has to do with everything. It could be anything. You understand that? It's not just food. So let me read further. Now, read this. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 202 and 203. Amen? It reads, When Christ was the most fiercely beset by temptation, he ate nothing. He committed himself to God and through earnest prayer and perfect submission to the will of his Father came off conqueror. So there are two, two things which we need to keep in mind that can help us to overcome appetite. So don't forget the two. So number one is earnest prayer. Here's number one. Number one is earnest prayer. And number two, perfect submission to God. If we neglect either one of the two, we will now overcome perverted appetite. Because it was through these two principles of overcoming and, and also victory, Christ came off Victor, not overcome by Satan. Amen? And thank you, Regina. Earnest prayer and perfect submission, he overcame upon the point of appetite. Amen? Those who profess the truth for these last days, above every other class of professed Christians, should imitate the great exemplar in prayer. Now, let me skip, skip around to get to the points about the benefits of appetite. So, so what I just said now, for those who, who just came on, we're just laying the foundation about fasting and using Christ when he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights as an example how that fasting can help us to overcome every other sin that is so prevalent here in the world today. Because it's by the indulgence of appetite that other sins can burst out forth. Think about that for a moment. And you can do your, your own study. Study to show yourself approved. Amen? So now, let's get into the benefits of 
of fasting, abstaining from food. Amen? Abstaining from food. And, and, and also, someone who is talking derogatory about religion, I pray that you hold your peace and listen. So now it reads, here's one benefit behind fasting from food. And here's one benefit. It reads, a preparation for the study of the scriptures. That's one benefit behind fasting. Amen? One benefit behind it. There are in the scriptures some things which are hard to be understood, in which, according to the language of Peter, the unlearned and unstable rest, or they take away for their own destruction. We may not in this life be able to explain the meaning of every passage in the scriptures. Okay? But there are no vital points of practical truth that will be clouded in mystery. So, in other words, when we are studying God's word, it is very vital and important that our minds must be clear. The brain organs must work properly when we're studying God's word. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Because if your mind is clouded and your judgment is overthrown, all these scripture passages will be as a mystery. It will be like a cloud that, that is just dimming your eyes and you cannot cl clearly see. As a result of your understanding being beclouded and benumbed when you're indulging appetite. Because when you're overeating, you're busy causing your brain and your nerves, your entire nervous system to be so overtaxed and that way they cannot function properly. That's why we must be temperate in our eating habits both at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner, in every habit of life. Amen? And not just in eating, but what we do, what we watch, what we listen to, what we are speaking, everything that we do, we're to give glory, we're to represent the character of God in each of our lives as we have a high profession of faith and of Christianity. Amen? Because... The brain, the mind, is the very vital point through which God can use us and in, in which he can communicate his Holy Spirit unto us, especially unto our conscience. And our conscience clearly tells us that once we read his word, study his word, that he tells us, shows us the way, the truth, and the life, and what we are to do to be saved and what is our true duty. But if our mind is beclouded and misunderstood, and the organs are not functioning properly, they're unbalanced, having an imbalanced mind, we're not understand, we will not understand the will of God. We don't have a practical understanding of God's will. Amen? So it's very important that, you, that your mind must be prepared to study His Word and even to read His Word. Amen? Because even when you read His Word, you can be easily distracted. Amen? And let me bring out another point to you which many people overlook. I have to bring this out to you. This is not in, in, in the slides right here, but I have to show this to you. How many, how many of you that, that go to church every Sabbath, you notice people are sleeping whenever a sermon is preached? How many of you have seen that? I've seen that many times. How many of you have seen that by showing of wands or emojis? How many, people, how many of you have seen that? You see people that are sitting in the pews, they're listening to sermons, and they're doing it like this. You've seen that, right? You've seen that. You've seen that. You know what? You know what's the main cause behind it? Indulging appetite, overeating your food, being a glutton. And you can read that in Testimonies of the Church, Volume Three, Page Three Seventy Four. Blessing, sister. Welcome. Testimonies for the Church, Volume Three, Page Three. 74, you read that when people are overeating and they're indulging appetite, their minds are so beclouded that when they're listening to God's message every Sabbath, sitting in the pews, they have a very hard time keeping their eyes open. And to be honest with you, when I was younger, I've, I have experienced that so many times. I've done that, okay? Let's be honest right here, okay? I've done that. Whenever I hear the message, I, I, I felt very drowsy. I had a very hard time keeping my eyes open. Keep on, 
you know, doing like this, having a hard time staying awake. Amen? Many people, many people just sound like they're about to fall asleep. Mercy, mercy. So you see, you see why that denying appetite is very important? It's not just with studying the scriptures, but also as I now get into the second benefit, it keeps you focused on something. Amen. So that way you will not run the risk of, you know, you know, bearing an appearance of of you not being so interested when you're when you're keeping your eyes so drowsy and not being fully awake. Because again, your mind, your nerves, your body systems are being so overly taxed with so much food that is in your system. Amen. You could re you recommend a light breakfast? No, I recommend a light dinner. A light dinner, not a not a light breakfast. A heavy breakfast is what I recommend, but that's another topic in itself. That's not the topic that I'm going that I'm dealing right here now. Amen. So this is the second benefit behind fasting. Amen. So now let's read further. Let's read further. Okay, so now it reads. Okay, let me read this from the book called Letter, page 73, and written in 1896. It reads, for certain things, fasting and prayer are recommended and appropriate. Amen? I eat too much. Well, we'll keep you in prayer, sir. What's your name, by the way? I want to, give, I want to know your name. I, want to, I don't want to call you by your handle. Because we'll keep you in prayer. Because when you eat too much... It will carry you to certain lengths in which it is unhealthy for you, in which it was very detrimental for your entire body. Matt, Matt, nice to meet you, sir. Blessings to you. So it reads, in the hand of God, they are a means of cleansing the heart and promoting a receptive frame of mind. So here's number three and number four. Number three, the third benefit behind fasting is it cleanses the heart. And number four, the fourth benefit, it promotes a receptive frame of mind. It helps the mind to receive certain things appropriately and not, and, and not in a way which it comes to your mind at one moment, but then you lose it at the next moment. You understand that? So that's number three and number four. Number three, it cleanses the heart. And number four, it promotes the receptive frame of the mind. Amen? Check out our ministry, brother. Sir, I just want to, first of all, I hope you're not self-promoting because if you self-promote here in my scope, and especially if, if I do not know you personally, I will have to block you. And therefore, I just want to tell you that you need to check yourself and make sure that you're not promoting any harmful information right here. So please don't self-promote or else you'll get blocked. Please. Thank you. It reads now in Gospel Works, page 236, it reads, it is in the order of God that those who bear responsibilities should often meet together to counsel with one another and to pray earnestly for that wisdom which he alone can impart. Amen. Unitedly make known your troubles to God. Amen. Talk less. Much precious time is lost in talk that brings no light now this is the motive that we can fast from food amen it reads on let brethren unite in fasting and prayer for the wisdom that god has promised to supply liberally amen it reads on further now whenever it is necessary for the advancement of the cause of truth in the glory of god that an appointment be met how carefully and with what humility should they, the advocates of truth, go into, into the conflict with heart searching, confession of sin, and earnest prayer, and often fasting for a time now. Fasting for a time, they should entreat that God would especially help them and give his saving, precious truth a glorious victory. So this is the whole motive, the whole reason why we should fast. Don't, we should not fast for just no reason or just simply because I just want to help myself. No, fasting doesn't just only help yourself. You can also help others when you are fasting. Keep that in mind. And give a saving, 
press a truth a glorious victory. That error might appear in its true deformity and its advocates be completely discomforted. So we dealt on the benefits of, of fasting and now we just dealt on the, the motive or the reason behind fasting and that is to promote the cause of God and present truth that the work of God, the work of preaching the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages may go forward to all parts of the world that people may hear, believe, and accept the gospel. We're not only helping ourselves, but most importantly and wholeheartedly, we are to help others. Amen? When we're fasting, not just from food, but from selfish interest, from our personal wants and needs. Because if we love God with all our hearts, and our neighbors ourselves, we should then deny ourselves, pick up the cross of self-denial, and walk in the same footsteps which our Savior, Jesus Christ, had trod in the bloodstained path of sacrifice. That's the, that's the whole motive behind fasting, and that is to know God personally for ourselves, to examine ourselves, to draw closer to Him, and also to help others that are also in need. And this is going, and this is what leads us now to the section of this presentation about what is the true fast, which, which is most highly important than literal abstaining from food. Amen. So now, now let's get right into this: the true fast. And you can find the true fast in the book of Isaiah, chapter fifty-eight, throughout the entire chapter. Amen. You read the entire chapter of Isaiah, chapter fifty-eight. You understand what true fast is all about. As a matter of fact, let's, let's go there right now. Let's go there. Let's go there. If you have your Bibles and King James Version, let's go to Isaiah chapter 58. And we'll read verse by verse. Not all of it, though. Not all of it. But the verses that mostly have to do with the, tr the true fast, what sacrifice is, and how we can help one another. In true love, and in true unity of the faith and of the spirit. It reads in chapter 50 of in Isaiah, in verse number five, it reads, Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and accept an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. It is not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest him naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. That is a true fast, and that is to abstain from sin. Abstain from wickedness. Abstain from the indulgence of selfishness and covetousness and your own personal wants. All the things that pertain to yourself. You abstain from these things. You, you forget about yourself entirely. And you focus so much in doing good to those that are suffering, that are hungry. Not only for, for spiritual food, the word, but also for physical food for water, for clothing, for every mutual need. Amen? And when you see that spirit being carried out in the lives of those who truly love God and keep His commandments, here is the result of such individuals. In verse number 8, it reads, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. So, when you're blessing others, you're doing good to others, it promotes your health. How, how so? First of all, it specifically promotes the, the free circulation of your blood. And it gives a satisfaction to your conscience and to your, your brain, your mind of doing good. And that's caused that good feeling to go throughout all the nerves, throughout all your blood vessels. And that way you will have no risk of having depression or stress or anxiety because you're not focused on yourself you're focusing on others. Amen. And that's very good for your blood. If you're have if you're suffering from from any issue of, of blood and so forth, you need to increase your the, circul the circulation of your blood by doing good to others, helping others, 
and stop thinking about yourself. Amen? Think about yourself. Because think about yourself is truly what's harming you. But think about others promotes your health. I hope you understand that. Now let's read further. Now verse number nine. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, ac accusation, put fault finding, and speaking vanity. And if, there's a condition now, if thou draw up thou thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. It's like a calcium, as it were. It promotes bone strength. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Amen? And this is why we need to understand concerning overcoming appetite, overcoming the things of the flesh and the desires of the flesh, and becoming more like Jesus. Amen? We're going from the, the depths of sin, from the mire of sin, onto higher ground of spirituality and righteousness. This is what we have to do, and there's a whole spiritual concept of understanding behind fasting and this is the reason why that why if when we're moved by the spirit to spend more time with God and even to increase his cause and to finish his work to fast. Not saying that we should fast every day, but we but every day we are to pray constantly because we cannot take a break from prayer because prayer is a constant communion of the soul with God as unto a friend. But if your appetite is so ravenous enough then you should fast you should fast for a certain for a certain number of times in order for you to overcome if you're that given over unto appetite because Solomon says in Pro in the book of Proverbs they should put your knife to the throat if you're a man given unto appetite that means they should commit suicide but it means that you should restrain yourself and do all all in your camp by through earnest prayer and submission to the will of God to deny yourself even to the point of appetite amen so keep that in mind and please do not bring out any any comment that's off topic otherwise you'll be blocked because block ministry is something that I do not like to to perform right here in my periscope but something that has to be done so please respect the scope or you can just simply leave by pressing on the X right at, at the top of the screen thank you so this is the whole understanding about fasting and about praying amen and those of you who came out late to the scope, you will always feel free to watch the replay. So why should we fast? It's because we need to draw close to the Lord, to have a perfect understanding of His will, and to know Christ personally for ourselves, as well as to start the point which we overcome sin, and to deny the needs of the flesh, and to rise up higher and higher in spirituality. But, but remember, we cannot do this in our own selves. We have to look at Christ constantly. Look at him by faith and behold him as he is fasting, praying, agonizing, suffering on the ground. You have to behold him in, in the in the um in the Garden of Eden. Especially when we, when we look at Christ at Gethsemane, how he was suffering, because just as Christ began his ministry in the garden of in, in the um in the wilderness, after he was baptized, even so by looking closely at the scriptures and the gospels that he ended his ministry after three years and a half by fasting and praying. You, you, see, you understand that? He began his ministry by fasting and praying and he ended his ministry by fasting and praying because I'm very sure that he had nothing to eat when he had that last Passover with, with his disciples because I cannot find in scripture where, where it says that Christ ate and drank with his disciples at the last Passover. I cannot find that. It says the disciples ate and drank but not Christ, if I re can recall correctly. And I'm sure you, you, you've seen that as well in the scriptures. Amen? But the whole point behind all this is this. If, we're, if we wish to overcome sin and to live holy like Christ, we must begin the point first on appetite, denial of self, and sacrifice. Without these things, 
we will not overcome, we will not come off victor, but still in bondage to sin. If we still have a desire to hold on to things which we idolize and hold dear to ourselves. Amen. So I pray you all were blessed by this evening's health talk and at the same time a study. This is not like a preachy scope, but this is basically a scope that is that deals partially on health and at the same time a study because it's it's all one and the same. Amen. But I want all of us, by the grace of God, to move forward by faith and to also urge us, urge all of us to draw closer to him and to study his word and to not allow appetite to overthrow us, nor to becloud our mind, our judgment, our thinking, nor our, our mentality, especially our moral worth. Amen. Be blessed. And I pray you all had a, had a blessed time throughout the day. And you continue to be blessed throughout this evening. And have a good night rest as well until we meet again by God's grace this week here on Periscope. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us and that you strengthen us to move forward by faith and not by sight. That we will overcome perverted appetite and not allow anything, O oh Lord, to be cloud our mind or our understanding. But that we will do all to increase our health increase our faith, and decrease our love for thee and for our fellow men for whom Christ died. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, Lord, and those that are watching this live and those watching us on the replay, on Twitter, and on YouTube, that they too may overcome and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Save us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So God bless, and Maranatha, the Lord is coming.